from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And I would like to welcome you all to the third and final panel of today's symposium entitled Zedan the Intellectual. Our first speaker today is Professor Michael Cooperson, who is a professor of Arabic language and literature at the Near Eastern Languages and Culture at the University of California, Los Angeles. He is a noted scholar and specialist of the cultural history of the early Abbasid period. Uh, Professor Cooperson is a graduate of Harvard University and of the Center of, uh, for Arabic Study Abroad, CASA, at the American University in Cairo. His publications include Classical Arabic Biography in 2000, Al Ma'mun in 2005. He has translated Abdel Fattah Kili. Kilitos, L'Auteur et Ses Doubles, the author and his doubles, and Khairi uh, Shalabi's Rahlat at Turshagi Wal Halwagi, The Time Travels of the Man Who Sold Pickles and Sweets in 2010. Uh, he is co author with RRAAL L Group of Interpreting the Self, Autobiography in the Arabic Literary Tradition and co-editor with Shaukat uh, Turawa, the Dictionary of Literary Biography, uh, Arabic Literary Culture. Uh, most recently, Professor Cooperson translated Jirji Zidane's The Caliph's Heirs. So without further ado, uh, Professor Michael Cooperson. And if uh, anyone would like to take them and distribute them to those who don't have, I would be very grateful. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's, been my, it's going to be my job to keep you awake, and I'll do my best. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Dr. and Mrs. Aidan for their enthusiasm and their kindness. I'd like to thank the Library of Congress, especially Dr. Murphy, who uh, rescued me with the handouts. Uh, I'd like to thank Brian and Alex, who are going to be showing us some videos today. Anything that goes wrong is entirely my fault. Um, I'd very much like to thank the colleagues who recommended uh, to Dr. Zaydan that I take on the task of translating the Caliph's heirs. Um, it's, you know, when I saw the translation, one always looks for the things that one thinks one might have done better. Um, although I have to say that pages 123 to 124 are really good. Um, <laughs> uh, Zaydan is brilliant there, and I think I was, uh, I was able to replicate um, what he achieves there. Um, I'd also like to thank my colleagues for teaching me so much about Zaydan and the Nahda. Um, I know most of what I know about Zaydan and the Nahda I have learned this morning. Um, the reason is that I'm a medievalist. Um, I work on the period that Zaydan was writing about when he wrote the Caliph's heirs. Um, and I've always been fascinated with the, the Nachleben or the afterlife uh, of this uh, golden age that we heard about uh, in other media. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today, despite being a medievalist, is television. Uh, I think it's the only medium which has the same power over us that the novel had for the men and women of Zaydan's time. I was very happy to learn uh, that Georgie Zaydan's great-grandson, George, is a writer, producer, and host of science education videos. Uh, so I feel that in talking about television today, I'm actually remaining within the tradition rather than diverging from it. 
The first clip that uh, I'd like to show you is from a television series called Abna al Rashid al Amin wal Ma'moon. So the, the sons of al Rashid al Amin wal Ma'moon, um, which is a 2006 Ramadan television series. So these are series where you eat a big dinner and you sit in front of the TV and you watch 30 episodes, one for each night of Ramadan, generally dealing with a historical or cultural theme. Uh, this uh, particular uh, production appeared in 2006. Uh, it's directed by a Tunisian uh, named Shaoui al Majiri. Uh, and the actors are Syrian and Jordanian. Um, and the filming took place in a number of countries, including Uzbekistan, where the closest, uh, the buildings that seem closest to the Abbasid, the structures of Abbasid Baghdad could be found. So, in many ways, it's a very interesting uh, production. I just want to show you the uh, introduction. Before I do that, let me. For those of you who are medievalists in the audience, a shout out to you. I'm going to tell you who you're going to see in the introduction. Uh, you're going to see the following historical and invented figures in order of appearance. Harun al-Rashid, uh, al-Abbasa, al-Ma'mun, al-Amin, he's the glowering, scary looking one. Zubayda um Ja'far, al-Fadl ibn al-Rabi'a, Ali ibn Musa al-Rida, who was played by Ghassan Mas'ud, who you may recognize from Kingdom of Heaven, he played Salah al-Din. Uh, Ulayya bint al-Mahdi, uh, Abad Umm al-Rashid, Yahya bin Khalid al-Barmaki, Sahal uh, bin Harun, then a fictitious bookseller, then Maraj al-Umm al-Ma'mun. Uh, this is the mother of the Caliph Ma'mun who in reality died after giving birth to him but in the show is allowed to live on. Jafar um, al Ali bin Isa bin Mahan, a fictitious jariya named Shams a fictitious mutakallam or theologian named Qusay, then Ibn Abi Duad, the Mu'tazili, then Al-Fadl bin Sahl, and then, I'm very sorry to report, Ahmed bin Hanbal, who uh, I spent years of my life working on and is given a rather shabby depiction in this series. Um, a fictitious historian named Aziza. Okay, now, so we have a historian who's a woman in the show, uh, which is not, does not correspond to any fact about the early Abbasid period, but it's sort of going a step beyond uh, Zaydan's uh, uh, Zaydan's uh, granting of a greater role to women. Um, then uh, a fairly obscure figure named Bakr ibn al-Mu'atamir, then al-Hasan bin Sahil, Tahir ibn al-Hussein, and finally a fictitious Hanbali named Ubada. Now let's hope that the clip works. Clip number one, please. <laughs> so that's uh, Ma'moon, actually. Can we get the sound up a bit? So those are actually, um, that's Rashid and Abbasa.
And I, I've read a lot of reviews of this. It caused a lot of scandal for various reasons. Um, the Shiites objected that Imam Reza shows up at a drinking party. The Sunnis objected that Harun was religious. And actually, the Abbasid family filed a complaint against the production company. Um, there, there are some descendants of the Abbasids still in Saudi Arabia, and they filed a complaint. Um, but in everything I've read, no one credits Georgi Zaydan. As far as I'm concerned, the credit should say, based on the series of novels by Georgi Zaydan. Um, so I'd like to do that here now. Um, now, this series, although it appeared in two, uh, 2006, many of the premises of representation are, in fact, identical with those established by Zaydan. There is an, uh, a disembodied, omniscient narrator. There is history understood as intrigue, uh, told at least partly through the escapades of invented characters, and we have a mediated and indirect relationship with the primary sources. Now, by this I mean that, like Zaydan, the writers of historical dramas, uh, like this, rarely use the speeches provided by al Masudi, al-Tabari, uh, and the like. Instead, they produce a kind of pastiche of scenes inspired by the chronicles, and they write dialogue in an invented neoclassical idiom. Uh, this is one of the reasons that people uh, who claim to like this sort of thing, and it's not everyone, but they say the language is beautiful, um, which surprises me because often it's just invented by a screenwriter rather than actually drawing on what, to me, is the more interesting language of the medieval chronicles, but that's just me. Um, I'd like to take one scene uh, just to, to talk about the hazards of this kind of historical representation, uh, the problem of what you might call the deceptive facticity of realism. Okay, because we're looking at something that seems real, uh, we imagine that somehow there is an unmediated relationship with historical fact. Um, this scene, uh, which I hope to be able to show you, um, is taken directly from Zaydan's Al-Amin wal Ma'mun. It's a scene taken directly from Al-Iqd al-Farid, which is an, a collection of and, uh, an Andalusian collection of historical reports, um, a medieval collection. Uh, in this scene, the mother of the vizier Ja'far uh, al-Barmaki, uh, who's been disgraced and killed by the caliph, al-Rashid, goes to al-Rashid to ask him to pardon the remaining, the remaining vizier, Yahya bin Khalid, okay? And in the scene, uh, in the original uh, medieval chronicle, uh, she and the caliph exchange uh, verses from the Quran and lines of poetry. Neither one is able to win the argument. So they're arguing in this classical style of quotation. Finally, uh, Umar Rashid, as she's called, uh, tries to take advantage of the fact that she was the one who raised the caliph from infancy. And she produces a little box containing his baby hair and his baby teeth, okay? And she says, by these tokens, I ask you to pardon my husband. And now, in clip two, we'll see how this scene was translated into video. لبسه أمير المؤمنين في دار أبيه يحيى عندما كان صغيرا. Translations on side one of the handout. ما رأيت أحفظ منك للأمانة يا أم الرشيد. لا تحفظ الأمانة إلا لأمثالك يا أمير المؤمنين. من هم أهل لأن يعطوا ويكافئ. ولكن يا أم الرشيد. إن الله يأمركم أن تردوا الأمانات إلى أهلها صدق الله العظيم ويقول الله وإذا حكمتم بين الناس أن تحكموا بالعدل ويقول أيضا وأوفوا بعهد الله إذا عاهدتم أي عهد تعنين؟ ما أقسمت لي به يوما يا أمير المؤمنين ألا تحجبني وألا تردني إن سألتك أشتري هذا العهد إذا وأحل نفسي منه افعل يا أمير المؤمنين اطلبي رضاك عمن عصاك حين ظن أنه يطيعك يا أم الرشيد إن لي في الحق عليهم عند العصيان كما لك عند الاسترضاء أم ترينني مخطئة لا حاشا لله أن يخطئ أمير المؤمنين فاطلبي ثمنا آخر 
لا أطلب شيئا يا أمير المؤمنين لا أطلب شيئا وقد جعلتك في حل من العهد إلى الأبد So what's happened here, among many other things, is that the, the box with the teeth and the hair has become a garment, right? And I don't know why that's true, although I suspect it's simply because for television you need a bigger prop, right? Um, and so this scene uh, reminds us, I hope, that the nature of the effect that can be achieved in historical representation is, of course, dependent on its medium. Uh, and one of the... Um, deceptive qualities of realism, as many scholars have pointed out, is this spurious facticity. The same, very much the same is true with television. Um, it's only when you've read the original Zaydan or read the original Iqlid Farid that you realize that in fact this scene has been constructed not only on the basis of some notion or other of historicity, but also uh, on the basis of questions like production, uh, visual effect, and so on. Um, and then you begin to I think, adopt what is a healthily relativistic attitude uh, toward this kind of representation. Now, what's very striking, however, is that many viewers treat this kind of material as being historically accurate. And I think, again, it's the language that has that effect. Even to the point uh, of a ver there's a very ironic uh, concomitant of this, which is despite all we've been hearing about Zaydan's uh, secular understanding in some ways of Arab history, I've had friends refer to this kind of show as Musal Saldini, a religious series. And the reason they do that, I think, is because of the language. People imagine that somehow, in the time of the Abbasid Caliphs, everyone spoke in this kind of uh, neoclassical Arabic and was constantly quoting poetry and Quran. Um, and so, rather ironically, this has come to fulfill a somewhat different function in the historical imagination uh, than uh, Zaydan's novels may have done. Um, in the uh, paper, I uh, talk a bit about the problem of representing the Golden Age, uh, which is, I think, a problem that I'd like to think more about. Um, and since my time is limited, I'd like to um, move to the last part uh, of the presentation where uh, I'd like to try to defamiliarize these conventions. All of these conventions of historical representation have for us become so naturalized uh, that we don't recognize them as conventions anymore. I, I think one way to do that is to look at some of the ways in which Zaydan and his vision of history has been adopted in other traditions. So I'm going to conclude with a clip. Um, I'll show you the clip and then I'll say one more thing and then I'll conclude. Um, with an Iranian TV series called Velayete Ejr, or The Rule of Love, uh, which is a historical drama uh, based on the life and times of the eighth Imam of the Twelver Shia. Uh, the period covered by the series is exactly that of Zaydan's Al-Amin wal Ma'mun, uh, and almost exactly that covered by uh, Ibn al-Rashid, this, this uh, series, the Arab series. But the Iranian series is, of course, based on the uh, historical imagination of the Twelver Shia, according to which all of the Abbasid caliphs were illegitimate. Okay? So, we have this uh, strange vertiginous sensation of watching all of the heroes become villains. Uh, in this clip, uh, which is one of the great highlights of the series, Ma'mun reacts to the death of his brother, uh, Muhammad al-Amin, uh, during the siege of Baghdad. Now, um, the Arab historians have depicted this scene in many different ways, but generally all that happens is Ma'mun looks at the head and makes a remark, uh, and his minister, uh, looks at the head and makes a remark, and there are different remarks made based on which source you consult. But in the Iranian series, we get a full-blown Shakespearean soliloquy. It's really terrific, and the translation is on the back of the sheet. Number three, please. Hormat Muslimin as mal huz namayan. In tor nist? Ami tor as ganir. As taher har sana har do hamal mi goftan ke man ba khishtan mi guyan. As khod mi porsam. آیا قتل امین واجب بود؟ به گردش در آورید سر برادر مرا بگذارید تا همه بزرگان و دولت مردان عباسی ببینن چه کسی بر خاک افتاده است این سر که بر روی سپره است سر برادر من است آیا عزیزتر از برادر میشناسی؟ آیا در دنیا کسی از برادر به برادر نزدیکتر است؟ به گردش در آورید تا همه سر برادر مرا ببینن 
و در دلشان به این نکته یقین حاصل کنند که سنگل تر از معمون در این کره خاکی تنها خود اوست به گردش در آورید به گردش در آورید تا همه بدانند معمون تا کجا به مسلحت مسلمین وابسته است به گردش در آورید تا همه ببینند آن قسمت از وجودم به عنوان خلیفه کوچکترین ترحمی بر آن قسمت که برادر خیش را میطلبد ندارد در اینجا میخروشم و در خلوت میگریم در اینجا تاهر را میستایم و در خلوت هر سمه را عزیز میدارم این سرنوشت من است که پیروزیم با مرگ برادرم عجین باشد تقدیر چون این خواسته است شبی که هادی مرد هارون بر تخت نشست و من همان شب به دنیا آمدم خلیفه ای مرد خلیفه ای بر مسند جلوس کرد و خلیفه ای زاده شد سرنوشت من پیش از تولد این چنین دردناک رقم خورده است از یک چشم عنوان برادر میگریم و از چشم دیگر به عنوان خلیفه به فتو پیروزی مسلمین می نگرم حال به خلوت باز می گردم و ساعتها و روزها به خاطر برادر از دست رفته خود مویه می کنم. Kind of funny to hear Georgie then in Persian, huh? Uh, well, no, it's easy to look at this and say that this belongs to a different order of representation than the one pioneered by Zaydan, which I argue in the longer paper is essentially a Sunni-inflected tradition. Uh, but in spite of the difference in manifest content, I think uh, the series is just as dependent on the conventions established by Zaydan. Uh, these conventions are so well established that they've become invisible. Uh, in fact, the, the show at the end shows, uh, in the credits, actually starts listing all of the medieval sources that it's supposed to have come from. And the person who brought this to my attention said, Michael, you're going to like it. It's all true. I, I once wrote a book in which I argued that Ma'mun did not poison the imam of the Shia, as the Shia argue. Um, and I told my wife all about it. And she read several papers I wrote explaining what a great guy Ma'mun was. And after she saw the show, she's from Iran, uh, so we watched this together, and she was crying at the end. And I said, Master Jun, I just explained to you that it's all not true. <laughs> she said, I don't care. <laughs> now, as far as I know, the only writer to draw attention to these conventions as such is a Persian comic novelist called Iraj Pezeshkazad. Uh, he has a novel written in 1958 called Mashallah Khan at the court of Harun al-Rashid. And in the novel, a bank clerk becomes so immersed in Zaydan's novels that he actually travels back in time to the court of the Abbasid Caliph. And when he arrives, he meets many of Zaydan's characters. And he amazes them by predicting the future based on his knowledge <laughs> of what happens in the books. So this whole thing is played for laughs, but the point to be drawn from it, I think, is a serious one, which is that uh, Zaydan has given generation after generation of readers and audiences an image of the past that most of them have come to take for the real thing. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Cooperson. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Thomas Philip, who is a leading expert on the life and thought of Juzhi Zidane, as well as the development of Arab thought in the 19th and early 20th centuries. His study, Juzhi Zidane, His Life and Thought, uh, published in Beirut, 1979, was a classic study on Zidane supplemented by various articles on different aspects of Zidane's work. From 1988 to, uh, to 2008, he was professor for Politik und Zeitgeschichte des Nahen und Mittleren Ostens am Institut für Politische Wissenschaft at Friedrich Alexander Universität Erlangen Nuremberg. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, before that, he taught at Brandeis University, Dartmouth College, and the University of Haifa, and Harvard University. He obtained his PhD from UCLA in 1971 and his BA from Hebrew University in 1966. So without further ado, uh, Professor Thomas Phillips.
Uh, well, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't have any videos um, to show you. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's, it's just a small uh, aspect that I want to discuss to you, uh, with you, to simply show the complexity of uh, the thinking of Saidan, the, also partially the contradictions, which were very much uh, part of the time in which he lived. Um, we are all familiar with um, the preoccupation of Zaydan with Arabic literature and history and his merits in um, um, uh, extricating them from a religious interpretation into a secular interpretation. And in the, the, while I was doing research on this uh, topic mainly, I came to detect a certain dissonance in this uh, predilection in things Arabic and his political stand at the time of the, what is called usually the Young Turk Revolution, but was called in Arabic Al uh, Inkilab al Osmani, the Ottoman uh, uh, turnaround or uh, revolution at that time, uh, was the meaning of the word. Uh, and uh, the contradiction here is that actually, and here I would agree with several of my uh, the previous uh, uh, um, speakers uh, was that he firmly supported the Ottoman Empire and uh, again this is not only his attitude but quite a number of people they related to the Ottoman Empire as the state this was what it was and this uh, and uh, what is, but what remains a contradiction, what remains remarkable, and I try to follow this a little bit here, is that he was keenly aware of what he did in terms of Arab literature and Arab history, uh, and yet he supported the Ottoman Empire, and in particular the Young Turks, who found many enemies, um, the, until the end, so to, so to say, until the end of his life, for sure, um, and uh, he, even though it must have been clear to him that this idea of the Ottoman Empire was unsustainable, that uh, it had outlived its time, uh, and uh, he, the wars in the Balkans and the occupation of Libya and so must have shown that the, this empire could not defend any, anything anymore. Uh, how does he come to this? thoughts and what what do they really imply his political interest uh, and i mean not just interest in political events but specifically discussing political system better verse uh, which is ideal uh, can be traced very much to the russian japanese war the russian japanese war is a to my mind a landmark in, in, the, in the history because it was the first time that the non-european uh, power beat a European power with its own modern weapon, uh, weapons. And the difference one perceived in the Middle East, but many other countries in the world too, was at least the name, Japan was a constitutional uh, monarchy. And uh, the Russians were the worst of reactionary regimes in Europe. The consequence was to think, therefore, constitutions is what we have to have. And this gave a new revival to constitutions uh, or inspired many people. After this uh, victory in 1905 of the Japanese in the naval battle, um, it comes the Persian constitutional revolution. And of course, not only because of the, the Japanese won, but it was in the air. And this was sort of the final stimulus to do it. Um, the Persian Constitutional Revolution begins in 1906, the Ottoman Constitutional Revolution in 1908, um, and the Russian uh, up uprising uh, occurs in the, uh, during the same time uh, too. So this was very strongly in the mind, and he emphasizes that, Zaidan saying that the Japanese example in Constitutionalism were very much discussed here, and he says, uh, uh, is he, uh, Zaidan says is a, is a sensation was that uh, the Japanese won the war, even though, he said, 
um, uh, uh, they, the, the Japanese and other Mongolian people, they considered to be called civilizational level inferior to the Caucasian people. Sounds very racist, isn't it? Uh, uh, it was much more common without any particular racist attitude to talk like this. Um, and uh, he says even for the Russians, this had a good impact because they too turned to uh, a more liberal uh, uh, regime. Uh, so this makes an enormous impact on him. And uh, in the, at the eve of the Ottoman uh, revolution, that is to say the Persians um, do already the uh, uh, constitutional revolution, and the Ottomans just begin uh, one, one, uh, are about to start their revolution. He write, writes lengthy articles uh, in Al Hilal about uh, the question of government, the question of uh, revolutions. Uh, he uh, gives one example. He uh, writes an article of the War of Independence of America and uh, the uh, Indian uh, Rebellion against the British and asks him himself, why? did the Americans succeed? Why did the Indians, who were so many more people than the British, did not succeed? And to make a short story, he puts it all to education. The level of education that Americans enjoyed compared to the lack of education uh, that, uh, uh, that the Indians had. Education is an essential part if you want to uh, make uh, revolutions and independence, uh, the, the, uh, or the idea of independence, he connects very closely with education. You must have education, otherwise you can't uh, handle the uh, government, you can't, you don't know what it means, the independence and freedom, all this has to be learned and the first thing for the Arab society is to have institutions of higher education. This was a key aspect and here he is very much the enlightened person, and many shared these ideas of general education. By the way, also the young Turks shared these ideas of general education um, as a prerequisite for whatever comes after. Um, the, Ottoman, uh, the Ottoman Revolution, or the Young Turk or, uh, Revolution, occurs in July 1908, and the next year of Al Hilal is full with articles about it. Long introductory article of Zaidan, but he also asks other people, uh, like Rafik Al Azm um, and um, Al Khalidi, one of the Al Khalidis. Uh, um, hmm? uh, Rafi, uh, Rashid, Rashid, uh, no, not Rashid, of course not. <laughs> uh, anyway, one of the one of Rashid's uh, forefathers, uh, who all write about this revolution and the, the positive aspects of it, um, and uh, also with good analysis, why did the first attempt in, uh, in, in uh, 78, 1878, of establishing a constitution failed. So the reasons are mainly a question of um, pre being prepared, by which Zaidan means again, people don't know enough. People have to be educated toward democracy, uh, uh, and it takes time. Uh, in many ways, also um, uh, ar uh, an argument of the British at the same time uh, talking about Egypt. Um, there is no doubt that for a moment there was great enthusiasm and the hopefulness that speaks of, uh, out from these articles and touched, uh, it was a mood that touched all groups of the Ottoman pe peoples really uh, in their various ethnic and religious divisions. Uh, and the hope was that uh, freedom secured by a constitution and representative government would create that unity of all Ottomans that would make the Ottoman Empire stronger and more uh, resistant, uh, more unified and more uh, resistant against the foreign impact. Um, there is a a question to the, uh, to the, by readers, he often worked with, I don't know whether real readers or imaginary readers, but very often the right question is asked in Al-Hilal, 
about the problems that bothers him, uh, who says, who asked him, well, is this revolution also going to collapse like the uh, attempt to establish a uh, constitution a generation earlier? Uh, he, uh, he, or is it going to hold, and will that really bring uh, progress? Zaidan says, now we have educated people. We have a whole class, not inferior to civilized people in the most advanced countries. Um, a, a, and the retreat after the revolution from the feeling of personal freedom and unity is unimaginable, and a return to tyranny, a tyranny impossible. Uh, it, it just follows uh, various, under, uh, uh, various other, other articles in the same vein. Um, then in April 1909, that was a time when there was an attempted counter coup, and I don't know whether the volume came out or the issue came out before or after the coup, but he's much more careful, defensive. He says, yes, the Committee of Union and Progress, the Young Turk regime, has been accused, he said, of uh, manipulating the elections, the parliament, uh, with results that the Turks obtained uh, too many seats, while the Arabs hardly got any. Some Arabs thereupon suspect the unionists of practicing radical Turkish nationalism under the cover of loyalty to the Ottoman community. If a Muslim Arab did not get a position he is expected, so uh, Georgi Zaidan, he would blame immediately Turks and Turkish, uh, and Turkish um, Asabia, a fanaticism, if you want to, despising the Arabs. Similarly, the Christians would blame that the uh, Muslims uh, hold against the Christians, and so on and so forth. He said, at, at this point, our concern is, of course, with the Arab cause, because we belong to them, we speak their language, and share their character. We are particularly concerned with this cause because of our personal interest, since we stand up for the Arabs and concern ourselves with their literature and history. We do our utmost to advance their affairs, and one of the greatest wishes is that the Arabs should have a powerful state, Daula. He is very conscious of what he's saying, he's very conscious what role he plays, and feels he has to defend that, and uh, uh, the, the, the last word he wishes for the Arabs, a powerful state, is not a declaration of independence, but in the context it becomes clear he means the Daula, the, the state of the Ottomans. He wishes for the Arabs, the Ottoman, the solidity of the Ottoman state. This is uh, what is really uh, what he wishes here with all what he says about his interest in the Arabs, and he is for them, he wants them uh, to, to flourish, uh, but the framework remains the Ottoman state. And he feels that uh, the Arabs have to be blamed for raising the suspicion of the Turks in many ways, of the young Turks in many ways, by founding, for instance, secret or half-secret clubs only for Arabs. Uh, that has a bad smell, and he is very much against uh, this, this. And after the counter coup, which was a shock for many, and for him in particular, the attempted counter coup, it was uh, suppressed then. Um, he says, it may be objected that the uh, young Turks' autocratic use of power goes against the spirit of the constitution. But we would reply, how splendid autocracy is when it is autocracy of the intelligent and the just. Sensible people agree that the East will never achieve a NAFTA except under just and wise autocratic rulers. In fact, this is the best form of government for every people. And the ruler, ruler's power is only limited through the Constitution because there are so few intelligent and just men. However, different, how, 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 sorry, how different is the situation now when we have been fortunate enough to have so have a committee bringing together the best of the wise and the just. It's autocratic. It's autocracy. Its autocracy goes hand in hand with consultation. Uh, so he shifts here much more to, uh, um, he, after having talked before about uh, the participation of the people and so, he shifts much more to um, 
uh, in auto autocratic inclination, uh, more pa uh, or paternalistic uh, regime of um, uh, uh, for those who want to protect the Constitution. The Constitution needs protection. Um, okay, so here you see what, what I mean by a, a contradiction. Uh, and the question is, how does he get there? And how, why doesn't he and many of his contemporaries uh, understand that, as we know in hindsight, that this would not work out? Because the science certainly were there, and yet he holds uh, desperately to, uh, that's my interpretation, to this ideal of the Ottoman state. The first answer is indeed really, um, he was not alone with strugg in, in struggling with this constitu uh, contradiction. Um, his, uh, one generation earlier, Butrus Albustani, had already set himself up really for such a question. And as uh, uh, Butrus Abomano uh, says, I quote, Bustani led the way culturally to Arabism, politically to Ottomanism. But I would say he could not bridge the internal contradictions of these things, which in 1860 and thereafter perhaps was not so important. But at the eve of World War I, it was quite important, and a lot had happened since then. Uh, another reason I would think, uh, I, I believe, uh, is uh, that after 400 years of Ottoman rule, it wa was, and in spite of what most Arab nationalism claimed, it wasn't such a bad time. It became very nasty during World War I. But for a long time, this government, the Ottomans, you know, considering the times and circumstances, uh, weren't so bad. They were bad sultans, but the regime as such, as a state, was never questioned. And I think there, there really was a problem uh, for this generation to imagine something else beyond the uh, Ottoman order of the Middle East. Uh, there's a very interesting um, poll that Rashid Ritter did in his uh, magazine, Al, Al Mana, where he asked um, some, I think, 20 uh, uh, intellectuals, what do we need to improve the condition of the Ottoman Empire? This is 1913. And there's not a single one who says, forget it. It doesn't work. They have different opinions. Zaidan is one of them. They say it takes this much time, or we have to do more Islam or less Islam, um, more technology or more humanities, whatever, all sorts of uh, uh, proposals. But nobody says it's irrelevant. So it was really hard for them to, uh, to speculate beyond the Ottoman Empire itself. Uh, the other thing was fear, a very realistic fear, obviously, as history showed, namely that the Arabs themselves could not defend them, and if the Ottoman Empire disintegrated, they would be colonized by the Europeans, as it promptly happened after World War uh, I. Uh, but that is not the whole explanation. I, I think there's more to that than sort of a defensive explanation. Uh, after all, Zaidan saw as a major uh, movers in history individuals. And uh, he gave great importance to historical individuals, as also the uh, novels show. Um, this focus on the individual uh, as a cause for historical development also carried a great promise of the Enlightenment. You could, in uh, in the thinking of the Enlightenment, you could improve the individual. Uh, you could make a better human, uh, more re rational, reasonable person, and you could do that through education and knowledge. And if that could be spread um, a, 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 to, to a population, then, and here was a great hope and an exciting prospect, I think, uh, that you could achieve a an, an new society through the Enlightenment. Uh, a new society that was simply, I say it very uh, 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 summarily, uh, was a better society, whatever this better uh, might have meant. Uh, what worried him 
was again and again the question of the lack of preparation. Where were the individuals already prepared to run a state to do uh, to do this? Um, and in the last years of his life, one can see that it becomes he becomes disappointed uh, with this um, movement, but not to the point of giving up on the Ottoman Empire. Uh, it might be, in retrospect, have been a possibility that indeed a democratic constitution of the Ottoman Empire uh, could provide the greatest benefit to the multi-ethnic population and the intended reforms might have given a better chance to, uh, for the life of all its citizens. Um, but it presupposes a rational thinking uh, and that rational thinking would bring under the same circumstances all human beings to the same results and mutual understanding. I think this is a misunderstanding of or an underestimation of the enlightenment at all, this faith and the reasonability. What is completely lacking here in this uh, equal, uh, equation is the uh, emotional, the impact of human emotions, ideologies, and especially what became the most important one, the, the dynamic power of nationalism, for the better or the worse. Uh, and, and that, in the framework of an um, enlightenment background, and this is something I believe that all Nahdawis uh, uh, um, uh, absorbed uh, in, to, in different degrees, um, that uh, simply with a constitution and in, uh, a parliament you could do this. This was somewhat uh, naive uh, and uh, underestimating uh, these powers, especially the power of um, nationalism, which was rampant at the time and very uh, visible. Uh, at, the uh, at the end, Zaidan might have sensed the fu futility of the pro a project called Ottomanism or the Ottoman community, the Ummah. He called it the Ummah, and I'm reminded of what uh, uh, Mabel Chakri said earlier, the Ummah as a moral community, and that was for him the community that he strive, uh, strove for. And uh, it, it, it might be that he saw the futility in the end, we don't know. Uh, we only know that he ceased to comment on the, uh, uh, much on the people and on the, uh, uh, um, uh, on the uh, revolution itself. And we cannot know what, how he would have reacted to the gigantic changes that were to follow. He died very briefly before the beginning of World War I. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Philip. And now the final speaker, uh, Dr. Zidane, a man who needs no introduction and has been introduced uh, earlier, the head of the Zidane Foundation. Thank you. <clears throat> Fortunately for Mohammed, I did not go to a German university. <laughs> okay. Seriously. Uh, my talk this afternoon is entitled Georgi Zaidan, the cultural entrepreneur, his values, beliefs, and attributes. It's an expanded title to which I added the cultural entrepreneur, and I think the reason will become self-evident as I go through my talk. We spend the day discussing Georgi Zaidan's contributions to Arab thought and literature. It has been said quite accurately that Georgi Zaidan was many men in one man. He was a journalist, historian, linguist, social and educational reformer, political scientist, and more. My task now is to try and describe his values, beliefs, and attributes 
in a way that explains his ability to contribute meaningfully in so many fields. By now, all of you, even those that came pretty late, know that Georgi Zaidan was my grandfather. But what you don't know is that he died in 1914, some 25 years before I was born. I therefore had to rely on various indirect sources to describe the personal and professional qualities that explain his success. First and foremost, I relied on family reminiscences of his children. The value system and principles he instilled in them guided their private lives and enabled them to build Dar el Hilal into one of the biggest publishing houses for periodicals in the Middle East. Second, I relied on his autobiography. It covers only the first 20 years of his life because of his untimely death, but it is invaluable in understanding his formative years and how he himself explains the reasons for his success. Third, I relied on the recollections of his literary and journalistic peers who knew him well, and last, on his own writings, mostly in articles in Al Hilal. A few comments on the early influences that shaped Zaidan are useful in understanding his values, beliefs, and attributes. In his autobiography, he describes how he rose above the class in which he was born into a third class that emulated the Victorian values of the European middle classes. He says, quote, at that time, the people of Beirut consisted of two classes, tabaqatan, the lower class, al amma which means the riffraff, the artisans, all the other people with menial occupations, and the small merchants. The people of the government and the rich constituted the upper class, al khasa But the social norms were basically one and the same, as far as family life, manners of speech, eating and drinking were concerned. Obscene expressions were predominant in the speech of the rich as much as the poor. <laughs> he goes on to say, after the unrest of the 60s, there developed a third class amongst the people of Beirut, educated in the Christian missionary schools, especially the American, English, and German ones, this third social group was determined to change the social norms so that the contemporary morals of Beirut became comparable with the most advanced habits and customs of the Europeans. I began to form my own opinions and to express independent views. When I met Saul and his friends, these were members of that third class, I found myself able to follow them and I imitated them successfully in their virtuous ways." End of quote. In making the transition to this new class, Zaidan was strongly influenced by a book he read in his formative years, namely Samuel's, Samuel Smiles' Self-Help, a book translated by Yaqub Sarouf as Sir Najah, or The Secret of Success. In many Victorian homes, Samuel Smiles' book, Self-Help, had a status second only to the Bible and was considered a classic of Victorian values. Smiles packed his book with remarkable people to give some idea of the vast range of possible models of success. But all these stories are ingrained in a philosophy of individualism freedom of thought and action that makes every individual responsible by himself for his growth. The social political context for Smile's ethos of self-help was a political and social environment of freedom of speech and action. It is best captured in the philosophy of the British Liberal Party of the late 19th century a party that reflected the values 
and represented the interests of the middle classes. John Stuart Mill's principle of political liberty and Adam Smith's economic laissez-faire provide the enabling environment for possible growth. But it is the ethos of self-help that allows the individual to realize his full potential. Zidane's nation-building efforts focused on educating the middle classes, getting them to graduate, so to speak, from the al am into which he was born into the third class whose values he adopted. Zidane believed this class was the main engine of progress for the nation. He saw in the trajectory of his own growth and development the possibility Indeed, the desirability that the progress of nations would mirror his own personal experience. I can't help but reflect that if Georgi Zaidan had been a British citizen, he not only would have voted for the Labour Par Liberal Party, but could have become an excellent developer and promoter of its doctrines and philosophy. He was a true liberal in the traditional sense of the word not the disparaging way this term is sometimes used today in U.S. political discourse. Moving to his personal qualities, the best place to start may be a memorial article written about him by Khalil Motran. He describes Zaidan in these terms. I have not known a man that combined two such antithetical attributes greatness and modesty. Nor did I see or hear him ever complain about his fate to anyone or wish any ill towards someone with a word or as much as a hint. I never witnessed once from him a desire to avenge himself from a critic of his work that was the source of his income and his fame because of his belief in the honor of his mission and the purity of his work. As for his literary work, he balanced it and dressed it up so that it would appeal to a prince, draw a friend closer, and stimulate the admiration of strangers with, an, with no affectation or pretense whatsoever and with the utmost simplicity." End of quote. I use this description to select from his own writings those articles that best applied to him. I group them under four headings which best describe his attributes. First, honesty in words and deed. Second, hard work and time consciousness. Third, entrepreneurship. Fourth, modesty, timidity, and moral courage. Let us review each of these attributes. Concerning the first attribute, honesty in words and deed, Zaidan elaborates at length on the traits marking superior character in an article entitled, Honesty in Speech is a Form of Superior Conduct. He contrasts the approach of Easterners with those of Westerners. Regarding Easterners, he laments their tendency to list to tell the listener what he wants to hear rather than what the speaker truly believes out of a misguided sense of politeness. For example, a writer that reviews a book or an article or a poem will invariably play, praise it and flatter it and justifying this because it offers the author encouragement, quote unquote. But Zaidan takes issue with this and says, this is a noble aim, but if criticism is offered to improve style and to raise standards, it contributes to intellect and is of greatest use to writing and reading. It is a grave error if a person is only allowed to hear praise and flattery for his works and his views, for nothing of human behavior may truly approach perfection. End of quote. Moving from honesty in words to honesty in deeds, Zaidan elaborates on the importance of integrity for success. 
He takes the case of Salim Sednawi, the founder and owner of one of the biggest department stores in Cairo then, and says in an article about him. It is a widespread delusion that wealth cannot be acquired honestly, or that trustworthy, honest men are poor during their lifetime and die destitute, or again, that only dishonest, hypocritical tricksters get rich. Sayings, proverbs, and poems exist on the subject, but this is the excuse of those who fail in their undertakings despite their desire to work, their vigilance, and their uprightness. They attribute their failure to their honesty and good intentions, whereas in fact, it is due to their lacking some of the prerequisites for success, such as intelligence, knowledge, perseverance, and the like. For honesty alone is not enough, even if it is accompanied by efforts and vigilance." End quote. Moving to the second of Zaidan's attributes, hard work and time consciousness, I would like to preface my remarks by reminding you of Zaidan's phenomenal output. It was nothing less than astounding. He edited Al-Hilal single-handedly and wrote most of his articles for almost 22 years. He also wrote a large number of books, in particular 22 novels, some 10 books on history, including the five-volume History of Islamic Civilization, and three multi-volume books on the history and philosophy of the Arabic language, as well as other books, including his autobiography. Zaidan did all this in the span of only some 22 years and all by himself. To quote Ahmad Hafiz Awad, if we as his contemporaries did not know with certainty that our departed friend and colleague wrote with his own pen all these works, organized their structure, thought of their subject matter, and supervised himself the way they were edited and published, all alone, without the ability to call on hired workers or rely on the contributions from literary figures. Had we not known all this with certainty, then we would have had very serious doubts that he was able to accomplish all this by himself. Because the quantity of his work is so monumental as to defy being the product of just one individual." End of quote. How was he able to accomplish all this? Zaidan learned from his youngest age to put in long hours of work. He would study late into the night after helping his father from sunrise to sundown to manage his restaurant. He retained this habit throughout his life, starting his working day at dawn. He also learned to organize his time effectively by putting a high premium on punctuality. And to quote his eldest son, my uncle Emil, not delaying until tomorrow anything that could be done today, as it might never get done. Finally, Zaidan was most economical in the use of his time, not wasting a minute, literally a minute, but, why, but what we would call today multitasking. He tells us in his autobiography how he learned this quality from his teacher. Quote, we would study some lesson and when my teacher left me to do some experimental work by myself, which would take two minutes, he used to turn to a book which he was in the process of translating and would occupy himself with it. He would translate two lines or three or a page rather than sit idly by while I was finishing my work. I acquired this virtue from him and it was of great use to me." End of quote. In short, Zaidan mastered all the elements of time management and credits this quality as a major cause for his success. As he says in his autobiography, at the root of my success were my consciousness of time and perseverance. We now come to the third of Zaidan's attributes, entrepreneurship. On this, Zaidan explained his views in several articles 
the most important of which was one entitled, Management is the Master of the Mind's Attributes, or in Arabic, Ittadbir Sayyid al quwa Al-Aqila. In it, he argues that worldly success is much more the result of management rather than the knowledge of facts or abstract intelligence. Zaiden describes the particular management skills needed for success in running a family, a business, a government administration, or a country. Singling out marketing skills as especially important in all these areas. I might note parenthetically that this was written before business studies became an academic discipline and before there was any business school in Europe in at this time. Mm -hmm. Regarding the craft of the writer, which is of particular interest to us here, Zaiden identifies three attributes of a successful writer or journalist. First, he must provide his readers with subjects that are of interest to them. On this he says, some of our newspapers are very well written, yet they have few readers, because circulation does not only depend on an excellent style, but it demands a choice of subjects which readers need or enjoy reading about. Second, a journalist must write in a simple, understandable style, the so-called al-sahl al mumtana that is a simple but difficult to replicate style. Zaiden was disparaging of those that used flowery words or complicated ways of expressing thoughts to impress their readers. We had a, run, a running family joke. We would poke fun at the man who said after reading a particular article, I loved it so much because it was so well written that I could not understand a thing about what it said. <laughs> True. <laughs> Finally, to gain the trust of his readers, a journalist must be objective. In Zaiden's own words, writers should display truth and frankness without inclining to any affiliation or party. Journalists should always stick to issues, never attacking persons or questioning intentions. This was neither common in those times nor even today in the East, where strong emotions often inhibit the rational discussion of issues. Zaiden took principal positions that he argued on the merits of the case and gave equal space on the pages of Al-Hilal to opposing points of view. Finally, we come to the last of Zaiden's attributes, modesty, shyness, and moral courage. Modesty was a hallmark of Zaiden's personality, as we heard one emphasized to me on so many occasions by my father. An article in which he describes in great detail the difficulties and therefore limitations of writing a history about the Arabs before Islam is an example of how conscious he was about his own limitations. This made him highly receptive to criticism. He viewed criticism as a means of self-improvement and a way of advancing knowledge. Zaiden was also by nature shunning, was also shy by nature, shunning the limelight. On this he says in his autobiography, I like to avoid the cause of enmity. From my childhood, I noticed this natural disposition in me. Therefore, I would avoid anything that would infuriate the teacher or would cause him to rebuke me or to beat me. 19th century. <laughs> Zaiden's modesty and shyness, however, masked an inner strength born from self-confidence. This explains the great moral and intellectual courage that he showed in promoting highly controversial views. The two most telling examples of this, of which we heard uh, about, about some uh, by previous speakers, is, are his views on the Arabic language and the pre-Islamic history of the Arabs. Arguing that the Arabic language was a living being that needed to be modernized and changed, he clearly questioned the premise of religious scholars that the Quran represented an ideal and static, unchanging model for that language. 
And contrary to the then prevailing view by Muslim historians, his book about Al-Arab Qawl al-Islam established a glorious history of the Arab nation long before the rise of Islam, the impact of which he was keenly aware. The Arabs' history and culture was related to and yet independent of the Islamic one and could disengage from Islamic history in the future. For these revolutionary views, Zaidan was attacked throughout his life, sometimes rationally in measured tones, but also viciously by religious dogmatists, as much because of who he was as because of what he said. In conclusion, Zaidan, born in the lower classes of Beirut, joined a new westernized middle class. He believed that character, willpower, integrity, and rectitude was the key to personal growth. His life's work can be read as providing the middle classes with the knowledge and education to help them replicate his own personal trajectory of growth and development. He credited his success above all to hard work, firm consciousness, and perseverance, and also to entrepreneurship, management, and marketing. His honesty in word and deed won him the following of a wide readership, as well as the trust of many friends. His shyness masked an inner strength of character that gave him great self-confidence and moral courage. But his non-confrontational nature, his belief that writers should display truth and frankness without inclining towards any affiliation or party, and his Christian Syrian heritage all kept him in the realm of writers, education, educators, and cultural activists, but away from political activism. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zidan. Do we have, we have time for two short questions? I was really interesting to see the series, uh, and you may, might have mentioned this, and I may have missed it. But um, when were, when was this uh, aired? I mean, w is this pretty recent or the Iranian series? Uh, no, the the, uh, Arab, the, the one Arabic one was 2006. Mm -hmm. 2006. So it's pretty recent. Yeah. <laughs> so that kind of reminded me of. Um, the recent debate in Turkey about um, the, this TV series on the Suleiman the Magnificent and his wife, uh, Huram Sultan, and um, how it was attacked and critiqued the same way. And I wonder if this is a common interest in history in um, these TV productions, because what we, there is what we call an Ottomania right now in Turkey. And um, the, 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 there is a lot of, there are lots of books, novels, like fiction, and also like these TV series that come out. And they're critiqued in the same way, um, you know, of being inaccurate. Um, the one, one critique said that women in the Ottoman palace do not, did not wear such revealing dresses, for example. <laughs> so, um, so I wonder if this is something that, like a recent rise in historical fiction, uh, also in, in, on TV. So, um, I mean, 2006, I would say, is pretty recent. But is this continuing, this um, interest in Zaidan's uh, novels on TV? Have you seen Osmanla Jumhriyeti? Uh, not yet, no. It's great. It's on YouTube, the whole thing. <laughs> oh, OK. Uh, it's uh, maybe interest some of you here. It's a series uh, based on the premise. It's alternate history. What would have happened if Kamal Ataturk had never lived? So at age seven, he falls out of a tree and breaks his neck. And the rest of the series is about <laughs> the modern day Ottoman Republic, which is run by a sultan who lives in a palace and he has a pink car and he drives it around. Um, and all of Anatolia is under American occupation. It's just great. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I have the subtitles if anybody wants it. Uh, the answer to your question is there is a historical mania going on right now. I counted 28 historical productions in Arabic since the year 2000 alone. So it isn't a new phenomenon. People have been doing it for a long time, but um, there's been an explosion of historical productions. Um, and many of them are revisionist, and many, of the people don't, many people don't like that. Um, in this show, for example, there are, uh, Ibn Hanbal is depicted as, um, uh, uh, I, I guess he's depicted in a way that's intended to critique present day fundamentalism. Um, and so there are people who reply that, that his image has been distorted. Uh, people complaining about the drinking, people complaining about adultery, people complaining about all of the things that the characters do in the show. Um, I just found a website in which someone quotes one of the screenwriters as saying, well, he meant to do all of that because he's a Marxist and he wants people to look again at their history. So the debate is, is ongoing and can be quite vigorous, um, although a lot of it happens in, on websites and places that it's, it's hard to track and things are put up again and taken down again. Um, so I, I can't claim to have a, a handle on it, but certainly the, the debate is very lively and I'm interested very much to know more about the Turkish case. Thank you to all our panelists. Um, Dr. Philip will give the concluding, an overview and concluding remarks. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Um, I've been asked to make some uh, concluding remarks. I'll try my best. Um, uh, a, whether an overview of the conference, uh, I don't know. Some, some papers are still missing, but uh, eventually I will uh, get them too. Uh, but let me begin with uh, expressing uh, my thanks to uh, different people and institutions. First of all, uh, the Library of Congress uh, uh, deserves our thanks for hosting this conference, and especially Mary Jane Deep and her staff who were instrumental in organizing this conference. Uh, I want to thank also uh, George Zaidan uh, for having had the original idea together with uh, uh, Hedda, uh, as I hear today, uh, and the vision to have promoted this pro project uh, to stimulate scholarship on the work of his grandfather uh, and uh, by necessity also on the Arab Nahda, which provided, provided the context for Georgi Zaidan's own work and upon which his work had considerable uh, impact. Uh, the Nahda as a cultural and historical phenomenon deserves a special, especially in these days, our full attention. George Zaidan, um, uh, George Zaidan now, uh, has also founded, uh, a, 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 together with this project, uh, the Georgie Zaidan Foundation, uh, and takes clearly with that a longer and broader view on the ac uh, academic activities on these uh, topics. Um, I also owe George Zaidan a very personal thank you because he derailed my academic plans after retirement. Uh, he led me down a different path, uh, at least for some time. Uh, and it turns out it was a very interesting path. Uh, as most of you will know by now, is that uh, more than a generation ago, I wrote my dissertation on Georgi Zaidan. Uh, uh, but not many of us are given the chance to go back to the scene of their early academic sins and reconsider uh, 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 what, they were do uh, what they had done. I was always uh, slightly curious, but actually um, there seemed to be other things that I wanted to do more. Um, and when George uh, uh, proposed this project, uh, I was not sure where this uh, journey would lead, but a curious agree enough to agree to his proposal. Not surprisingly, after a long life 
a long, uh, on, after a lifelong um, occupation with Middle Eastern history, my views have changed over time. Scholarship on the modern Arab world has developed in leaps and bounds in this generation since the uh, uh, 70s. Um, uh, uh, and, not, and new analytical approaches have helped to see new contexts and new perspectives. This is how it should be. Uh, after a generation of historiography, interpretations and analyses are contested, must be revised. That's part of doing historiography, to uh, revise things and go over them and reinterpret them. And sometimes they are replaced completely and sometimes they are reconfirmed. Um, and to have the opportunity to do this with one's own work is very ra rare. And for that, I thank uh, George to have given me that opportunity. Uh, finally, I want to thank all the participants today, uh, of today for showing us how much more there is that we can learn about Georgi Zaidan, uh, how much... Um, can be understood by providing uh, different uh, perspectives, different analytical tools. Uh, I must confess, I uh, always had, um, how should I say, not a very high opinion of the novels, but I've really learned by those who know something about literature, what you can do with novels and how you can interpret them and how you can uh, see what they express in terms of thought and culture uh, uh, of the time. And that was, for me, today and before that, reading these, um, uh, these papers, uh, uh, quite an interesting and important uh, lesson. And I think uh, this conference has been especially good in sort of uh, going somewhat into greater width, uh, width uh, of, of uh, scholarship and uh, it represents really, I think, uh, how shall I say, a new perspective, not only on Zaidan, but also a stimulus to look further into the Nahda uh, and its uh, 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 development. Uh, and your essays today and uh, the written form have uh, provided insights in that, all of them. Um, Jens Hansen, who offered us a very broad view of the development of the Nachta, how it was perceived, how we perceive it, how we can uh, come to better insights on that, and in the end, what was Zaidan's uh, place in it. In the same manner, uh, Roger Allen uh, took a rather broad view of things uh, concerning literature. Uh, he began with the Arabic and the European context of literature and tries here within that context to see the accomplishments as a novel, uh, uh, as a novel writer. Um, George Zedan very differently to, uh, drew a very personal picture uh, of his grandfather as a person whose values and virtues were largely anchored in the, the Victorian epoch. Uh, but I also think, in a, just very simply, in his personal rectitude, uh, rectitude, something that comes through in his writings and in, his, uh, uh, in the stories about him and how he behaves to other people. Even in his letters to his sons, I, I find this... Uh, uh, rectitude, as I would call it, for lack of a better word. Um, and, uh, he, and he was known for that, indeed, by his friends and his uh, family. Uh, Zainab Ben Lara, who unfortunately could not uh, uh, come today uh, to us, but was well represented by uh, George uh, Zaidan Jr., George Jr., um, he, he, he took a very different approach. She uh, was concerned about emancipation of women and wanted to extricate from the novels of Zaidan uh, what was his position on that? Uh, uh, what was his reaction to uh, the debate in Egypt at the time, uh, which was a very strong uh, debate and was in nothing behind the same things being discussed uh, in Europe. This was exactly the same topics, uh, this whole idea that 
it's emancipation for women as, is, is as good as, uh, as long as it limits it to being the mothers of the nation. This was often the expression also in uh, European nationalism, namely to raise uh, uh, knowledgeable and decent patriots. That, that was the task, uh, not necessarily for her own sake. So this was very much in common in, in Europe and in the Middle East and so on. Uh, William uh, Granara used the three historical novels uh, that uh, uh, George Zaidan wrote on Andalusia to uh, uh, discover here and uh, show us convincingly the development of his own, uh, Zaidan's uh, historical consciousness uh, that these novels uh, display, um, with his circle of the age of the gods and the age of heroes and the age of men. Um, Marvel Chakri reflected on Josie Zaidan on the course of history, his idea about a golden age, where such a golden age can be placed in the past or in the future, very big difference for all uh, interpretation and thinking about history. Um, and uh, uh, Anne Lord uh, Dupont traced the ambivalent relation uh, that Georgi Zaidan and Europe, uh, had with the European Orientalists. Because uh, on, the, on the whole, uh, the Orientalists, it didn't feel, somebody like Zaidan, who tried to interp interpret their own history, didn't quite fit into the European Orientalist picture, which was very colonial. These were people one ruled, and these were people for whom the Europeans delivered the, the, the interpretation of their life. And here come with the Nachter uh, people who, who do that on their own uh, was not necessarily highly uh, regarded and uh, uh, contradicted many uh, um, prejudices of the Europeans uh, about uh, the Middle East. And uh, last but not least, uh, Michael Cooperson who entertained us uh, uh, very nicely here. And, uh, but not only entertained us, he, uh, th this question of what does it mean, uh, how does he arrive? The question was, was earth, uh, raised earlier by uh, Professor Wien. Uh, how, uh, how do we know what impact it is? And one, indeed, one can find out a lot, whether it is today or at his own lifetime, about the media, seeing what the media do and how they, how they are doing it. Um, and a, a, personally, I know it from many, many anecdotes. Whenever I, the talk came to that, I had studied uh, Georgi Zadan, almost without fail, Arabs would tell me, oh yeah, oh his books, yes, I read him, that's how I learned about Arab history. Uh, it's not statistically provable, but is, uh, as an anecdotal, uh, it has an anecdotal value of that. And that happens again and again, and happened just very recently again to me. Um, uh, and uh, so one can and, and one should uh, tease out a little bit what becomes of that, what, what is made, especially when the media has changed from novel to, um, uh, to, to, to film or... Uh, uh, Silsila. Uh, so I, I think not only has, uh, has this uh, um, meeting today, this conference, presented um, a picture of what is being done, and that's very encouraging because there are lots of people who are involved now, and uh, I see that with great pleasure. Uh, uh, it used to be that only uh, Anlo and I knew something about the issue, <laughs> and, and it is very delightful to see that they, you, not only can it be stimulus, uh, stimulated, but there is an echo, and uh, one only can hope, and, and perhaps this has also um, uh, raised our ta uh, or, uh, stimulated our taste for more. Uh, there might be much more out there. We have only had a whiff of what can be done and what one can do with scholarship to uh, see and uh, evaluate the works of a person. 
Uh, let me uh, end with a footnote or a pet peeve of mine, whatever you want. And uh, it is something that particularly came to my mind when reading the essays in their first draft form and uh, already thinking about a publication. And it's something that uh, Dr. Maksud raised this morning. The question of the term, Nahda, and what do we do with it? Um, let me just very shortly uh, say a comment to the word itself, to the root of the word, a word which also has a history. Um, the Arabic root of nun uh, heida uh, means something very simple, an act of rising, a motion, a movement, uh, and then come other uh, meanings like strengthening. Um, um, that is a description that we find in Lane's Dictionary of 1863. Um, when uh, Al-Yazidji uh, Al addressed the Arabs in, their famous, uh, in the famous ode, Arise, ye Arabs, and awake, he didn't use the expression at all. And uh, a few years later in Bustani's Muhid al-Muhid, uh, it is uh, uh, lacks still any abstract meaning, but simply means an act of rising. The first where I found more than that, and it's not necessarily the first, but that's what I found uh, right now, is in Weir's dictionary, where all these uh, ideas of emotions that is repeated, like re rebirth, renewal, renaissance, uh, up are suddenly given to the meaning. And maybe that is already part of the fact that it had been translated in the meantime into German, or English for that matter, both uh, uh, as uh, the Arab Renaissance. Uh, uh, so, uh, but even, for instance, Al Munjit in 1969 just says karma and uh, rising, and, uh, but not more, and doesn't deal with it as, also an, uh, as an abstract. Uh, um, uh, meaning, uh, that, it has, that, that the term has an abstract meaning. Um, I, uh, Jens and I talked about it somewhere between 1880, uh, 18, uh, 1888, um, when Muqtatav used the term without further explanation in 92, when Zaidan did the same in al uh, when he speaks about the latest Egyptian Nahda, we know it does have a special meaning at this point. It doesn't need explanation, but everybody knows what you mean when you say the Egyptian Nahda or the, the Nahda of sciences or whatever connection it came. Um, in European languages, the term is most often translated, uh, and the example this morning was uh, Sarah Gardin's uh, speech, with Renaissance, the Arab Renaissance. Uh, just as the Arabs call the European Renaissance al Nahda al Urubia. Uh, and to talk about the Renaissance, uh, to talk about the Nahda as Renaissance, I think is highly problematic. It suggests a European frame of history of reference uh, as a normative standard of historical development. That, because if you hear in Europe, not a uh, renaissance, you mean something very specific that uh, implies a development from renaissance to humanism, reformation, revolution, uh, and so on and so forth. And so it is uh, taken in this free, uh, framework, and actually by translating it as renaissance, uh, the, uh, the opposite occurred rather than saying where the Arabs had a renaissance, uh, the Europeans uh, it, it did uh, challenge the validity of that, and in fact it leads to a denial of, um, of this standard, uh, of this, what they, the Europe considered normative standard of historical development. The European uh, development could not be recognized in non-European cultures. Uh, this denial of history for non-European cultures, that in the worst case to a racist sense of European superiority, and in the most benign version, 
to the claim that, well, these events took 500 years in Europe, so it'll take another 500 years in the Middle East because they have to go through the Ren uh, Renaissance, through Martin Luther, and so on and so forth. But because that was established as how history should really develop. Uh, therefore, I, I find this, um, Yes, uh, I find this expression Renaissance for this Nachta a very unfortunate one. Uh, perhaps it fits when one says the renewal of Arab literature. Uh, there it might be true, but on the whole, the, Renaissance, it's a, the Arab Nachta was much more, and certainly not only a translation movement, but it was this baiting of, uh, a fullness of ideas and concepts uh, which was uh, uh, overwhelming for many and which was often, as was said today, pointed out today, contrary within itself and contradiction, uh, contradictions uh, were uh, abounding. Uh, in other words, mm, well, the question is, what's really the solution? And here I would uh, second what um, uh, Jens Hansen said this morning, we should simply call it Al Nahda, which I will do in the book, which we hopefully publish. Al Nahda, um, it, just as we don't speak of the Quran as the Arabic Bible, which also would be a sort of taking possession of it from a European view of you, uh, we, should, we are well advised not to talk of an Arab Renaissance. It's, it's misleading, it's not the same, and it denies its authenticity uh, in, and, and its role in modern Arab history. With this nice thought, and I wish you all a good evening, and thanks for coming, uh, and we will continue these discussions elsewhere. Okay, thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.